So why gear shift? Sometimes when people talk about shifting gears, they're really talking about a change or shift in direction, as in things are really going bad, we need to shift gears. But shifting gears has less to do with changing direction than maintaining an optimal effort for a maximum efficiency, like pedaling a bike. Uphill or downhill, you have to shift gears for maximum efficiency. It's about moving forward without getting exhausted or burning out your engine. Gear shift is a metaphor for resilience, adapting to a forever changing landscape with all of its ups and downs. The speakers we've invited here tonight will present five projects that can improve the health and resilience of Capitol Hill, gear shifts in our ever-changing Capitol Hill landscape. I invite you to listen with an open heart and an open mind, and then participate in the conversation of your choice. And finally, uh, we know there are some folks who are not able to be in this room, but who are following along online. So if you're tweeting or posting about this event on social media, use the hash hashtag GearShift2016. Hashtag GearShift2016. With that, I'm happy to turn it back to Joel Sisolak. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chris. So for this next segment of the evening, this is uh, really excited about this. We have five presenters, all from the neighborhood, ready to, to give rapid fire presentations on five hot topics. And um, I will say that we're not going to do Q&A during this segment. I want you to um, hold your questions, your burning thoughts and um, passion for the discussion, which will come after when we'll have time for a deeper dive. So I'm, I'm going to just start right off and introduce our first speaker and uh, ask him to come on up, Zachary Pullen. As uh, Chris mentioned, he's the president of the Capitol Hill Community Council, and he serves with many organizations that challenge inequity and pursue justice and opportunity for marginalized people. Currently, he's the Director of Communications and Education at Pride Foundation, as well as a Commissioner on the Seattle Housing Authority Board, Vice Chair of the 43rd District Democrats, the Fighting 43rd, and a Steering Committee member for the Capitol Hill Champion. With that, uh, I'll turn it over to Zachary. Eighteen sixty-five. Five white men, some with names you might recognize, Denny, Yesler, Terry, drew the boundaries of Seattle based on where their property was. The first act of their leadership was to pass Ordinance Number 5, mandating the removal of all Native Americans from the newly drawn limits of Seattle, in ingraining into our culture that property is king. 1926. Ambler Realty sued the village of Euclid, Ohio, arguing that zoning had substantially reduced the value of land by limiting its use. The landmark Supreme Court case of Euclid v. Ambler held that zoning was constitutional. In Justice Sutherland's opinion, he voiced a socially dominant view of renters. One valid purpose of zoning, he said, was to separate single-family dwellings from apartment buildings, which are a mere parasite constructed in order to take advantage of the open spaces and attractive surroundings created by the residential character of the district. While the view of renters has softened, renters are still disfavored in spending on parks and under tax law, not receiving tax deductions for rent payments, for example. 1927, worried that black families might seek housing north of Madison Avenue, a group of white homeowners from our neighborhood organized themselves and began a campaign to change all of the deeds in the area to exclude whole classes of people based primarily on their race from owning property in the neighborhood, perpetuating again the idea that property is king. The Capitol Hill Community Club associated with this campaign wrote a letter in 1948 stating that a small group of interested people worked and kept 90 blocks safe through, through racial covenants. The Supreme Court told us tenants are second class citizens, property owners, owners tell us we are not worthy of calling this neighborhood our own. 
But tenants are not second-class citizens. Renters are the cultural and economic lifeblood of our neighborhood. I'd ask, between the three types of tenancy, homelessness, renting, or owning, which type of tenancy do you imagine someone like me, a young professional transplant, should live in when being a renter is the natural first step in planting roots in the city I call home? Thankfully, I'm not alone. A stunning majority of Seattle's land is zoned for property owners at 65% of the city. But in our neighborhood, renters make up 80% of the population, which is the highest renter to homeowner ratio in the city. We have power in numbers. It just requires us to organize and work together for common cause, our future and livability. That power can increase our impact on shaping the natural change in our city. When we cast out the idea that development happens to us and not with us, we will know the importance of our voices. When it comes to affordability and livability, our voices must be heard because our thoughts and concerns are what we give to our future. We need to be given the opportunity to, to cast a vision for the day when we might also be homeowners. Too often though, I hear the, the same old tired criticism toward my fellow renters. Renters are transients. Renters don't care about the neighborhood. I've lived here for 30 years and my opinion's more important. But we know that there are single family homeowners who feel like we're ruining the character of the neighborhood in a supposed war on single family homes. But when you elevate the voices and experiences of renters, vulnerable to crippling rental and rent increases, for example, then we will more holistically know how to solve our city's affordability crisis, including us informs our work in creating a renter and homeowner city. Because at 80% renter population in our neighborhood, we know that we'll have renters here for a long time to come. And the work is already being done. Last year's Holler recommendations brought many valuable policy ideas for tenants, empowering our renter community by getting rid of source of income discrimination, increasing access to those with criminal backgrounds, and tenant counseling, as well as including more affordable housing across our city. But there's still more we can do. At the Capitol Hill Community Council, all of us are under the age of 33, and six out of seven of us are renters. We're queer people, we're women, we're people of color, we're the faces of our changing neighborhood. Our mission is to represent and elevate the voices of residents of our neighborhood because we know when we come together, we can raise $1,500 for PACs for people experiencing homelessness. We can provide community service hours at local organizations. We can successfully lobby for an expansion of LEAD and MDT to our neighborhood, all in the service of creating the community we want to see and doing our part to, sh to shape the change happening in our neighborhood. That's why I'm excited about a joint project of the Capitol Hill Eco District and the Capitol Hill Community Council called Capitol Hill Renter Initiative. Our democracy should not be dependent on property ownership, and sometimes it feels like it does. History certainly reminds us of that. The Capitol Hill Renter Initiative will give power back to us renters. This year, we'll be particularly focusing on the hall of recommendations and affordability, but mostly we're building a movement. We need more leaders, though, willing to share your thoughts and ideas about shaping our neighborhood. All of this to me comes back to my value of home. We all deserve home and the feeling of safety that comes with it. Without home, we'd have nowhere to hang our hat. Thank you. Thanks, Zachary. So next up, uh, clipping along, is Sierra Hansen. Sierra is Executive Director for the Capitol Hill Chamber of Commerce position she just assumed last year. Prior to that, she had 17 years government, communications, and political experience in the Puget Sound region, and most recently ran her own public affairs firm, Hanson Public Affairs. Sarah Hanson. Good evening, thank you so much for coming out to Capitol Hill Housing's ninth annual uh, gear shift uh, community event. Again, my name is Sierra Hansen. I'm the executive director of the Capitol Hill Housing, or I'm sorry, Capitol Hill Chamber of Commerce. And we work with hundreds of businesses and community organizations throughout the neighborhood and host community events like Clean Sweep and Halloween to really bring the community together with an economic development um, lens. In case you're tweeting or tagging, our information is on the screen, so please use it. Talking about uh, our Capitol Hill business improvement area, uh, effort this year to pass um, this critical funding mechanism. Our neighborhood is exploding. Over the last five years, the city has issued 300 demolition permits, over half to multifamily and single family, ho single family homes. 
And their place has sprung up buildings with new businesses bringing new faces and businesses to our neighborhood. Fortunately, and along with those new businesses and new houses, we also have new transit to accommodate the additional 3,000 folks who are gonna be moving into our neighborhood, carrying 12,000 boardings as of today between the streetcar and light rail. So we know those numbers are gonna grow, we know the buildings are gonna keep coming, and that's why we need to also look at balancing how our economic district survives. We have new businesses alongside old icons such as Wild Roses and Dick's, now operate alongside Conan Steiner and Big Mario's. A recent audit of Broadway found a 20% turnover in a two to three year period. So how do we keep our diversity of businesses while balancing growth? It takes planning. Capitol Hill 2020 was created by hundreds of stakeholders coming together, creating an economic vision that balances growth and preserves our vibrancy over a year long period. And Capitol Hill 2020 has four core values that underlie every single effort outlined. They are convening our neighborhood, creating equity so all voices are heard, recognizing that community should be driving these efforts, and lastly, that prosperity has to weave through everything we do. So it also defines bold moves. Organizations need to evolve to meet new demands. Clean and safe cannot mean sanitize and gentrify. We must address the growth that isn't gonna stop anytime soon, and our businesses need to continue to be some of the coolest that we can find anywhere in Seattle. So with that, we've launched strategic initiatives. We're working with a number of public and private organizations to implement them that will keep us safe and diverse by identifying problems and working towards solutions, but funding is the key moving forward. And this is where a BIA comes in. So why a Capitol Hill BIA? If you want something done right, do it yourself. A BIA is community funded and community driven. The city doesn't have the resources or the on the ground knowledge to fix the problems that we see every day. Fortunately, a BIA can. Now, there will be a map that shows you how our neighborhood has grown. For 20 years, we had two sleepy neighborhoods. We had 15th, we had Broadway. They were the heart of our neighborhood. It's grown to six commercial areas, 19th Avenue East, 15th Avenue East, 12th, Denny Olive, Pike Pine, Broadway, a tremendous amount of growth, and a new BIA will capture the growth and economic vibrancy in these areas. One of our key programs is gonna be a clean program. See, Capitol Hill will never be suburbia, but sometimes it feels like we are swimming in a sea of litter, biohazard, graffiti, and sharps. A BIA will provide regular cleaning services to address this issue, which is especially needed during the daytime and for our daytime retailers. Public safety is also important. A quarter of our funding will help us move away from 911 and no trespass signs to implementing a holistic program that will partner with social service folks to help those experiencing homelessness, mental health, and addiction challenges. Second, or thirdly rather, um, a business development. Business is key to our neighborhood, but the only way we can do it is if we focus dollars to growing and sustaining our core businesses. Seasonal and year-round efforts like retail recruitment, temporary activation, and holiday events can bring feet, eyes, and dollars to our neighborhood that often remain in our neighborhood. Urban design, placemaking, and advocacy are another core component of the BIA. We can invest in our public spaces. We can do pop-up pillow fights, Halloween, and occasional lesbian weddings where people are dancing in fountains. You may recognize one of those faces. Um, and we can also invest in placemaking. These are the public investments that we need in physical space. So in closing, Capitol Hill and Seattle is full of creative problem solvers. We have decades of leadership that have worked on these issues and we need to continue to invest in our community financially and through um, just our own efforts to continue to challenge and grow. So I encourage you to join us on June 5th for our annual Clean Sweep event. There's flyers and information at the table and thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thanks, Sierra. Um, most people who know me know that I can't dance. And I, and I won't prove that point right now. I, um, but I am very happy 
every day to go to work and to look across the street from 12th Avenue Arts and see the big banner for Velocity. So I'm really excited um, to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Tanya Lockyer is the co-chair of the Capitol Hill Arts District and executive artistic director of Velocity, Seattle's premier art center and essential incubator dedicated to contemporary dance and movement-based art. Locker is also an accomplished artist and educator with more than 20 years experience presenting her work internationally. Welcome, Tanya. So how do we keep the arts on Capitol Hill? Well, raise your hand if you've ever rented your home or business. Some. Will you understand what a precarious position it is for Velocity Dance Center and artists and arts organizations to be renting in a hot real estate market where basically paupers sitting on a gold mine? Organizations like Velocity also need wide open spaces where we can create and present art and offer classes and be these community catalysts and magnets that we are. For example, last year, or every year, Velocity is open and available to the community 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Last year, we presented 150 new works. We provided $300,000 in direct and in-kind support to artists. And arts organizations bring so many communities together, uh, whether it's our students that range from you know, 4 to 84, or it's uh, community events like Black Lives Matter, or it's... Uh, all the hundreds of local companies who present all over this neighborhood because of all the venues. But the precariousness of being a renter almost destroyed Velocity. In 2007, when our home, the Oddfellows Building, changed hands, it was an old story. Artists made an urban neighborhood attractive to developers. Those developers moved in, and they raised our rents 300%. The story was Velocity landed on its feet. The reality is it was extremely touch and go until 2013 when we were finally able to erase the debt and deficit caused by the emergency capital campaign. But here's the thing. What happened at Oddfellows could have been anticipated and avoided. We all knew it was this great cultural asset, and it could have been purchased before the developers moved in and turned into a sustainable art center. So today we have this opportunity to anticipate, to invest in strong arts organizations before they're in a state of emergency and duress and kind of stop this cycle of poverty and vulnerability for arts not-for-profits in our city. Because almost a decade later, Velocity's back in this position of being a renter in a hot real estate market, and our lease is up in 2020. And we've also outgrown our current venue. In the past five years, our ticket sales have grown 348%. We are succeeding. We're bursting at the seams, but we don't have the capitalization necessary to actually take advantage of this next step in our trajectory. So what are the tools arts organizations need? Well, the Capitol Hill Arts District and the recent city money to create the pop-up V2 are our recent experiments. But V2 is temporary. It provides opportunities for artists and arts organizations, but it's not a long-term stabilizing solution. Arts organizations and artists need stronger incentives to actually stay on Capitol Hill. Number one is affordable housing. In our recent strategic planning survey, the majority of the 307 people who responded said that they live on Capitol Hill to be close to their arts community, but they'd be happy for Velocity to move if they could have cheaper rent. We can also provide strong incentives for developers so that they perhaps help us preserve art spaces or put art spaces into these new buildings that are popping up. These incentives might be giving 50 to 100 year leases to arts organizations or subsidies to create affordable commercial space for the arts or incentives to help create a more predictable and faster system for these developers like property tax abatements or helping speed developers through costly permitting processes if they'll support arts organizations. But perhaps we can also constrain and impose requirements on developers, like they do at the Lower Manhattan uh, Development Council, where they require uh, businesses and developers to create multi-use spaces that have to have public and cultural spaces in them, because it, it ensures economic diversity, and it ensures cultural vitality and livability. But most importantly, rather than wait for the next emergency, I encourage us to think like smart investors ourselves and anticipate. Invest in the capitalization planning of strong organizations now before it's an emergency. Invest in our stabilization through technical support and capitalization so we can actually you know, um, strategically pursue opportunity. 
So for example, provide technical assistance in the form of space planning and design, real estate searches, capital campaign planning, or facilitate creating these multi-faceted, uh, multi-purpose spaces that bring together really diverse organizations that have really different strengths. Or invest in capitalization by helping us plan for long-term ownership years in advance, provide savings for a down payment, or the upfront capital investment that every business needs to succeed and strategically grow. The best time to, invent, to invest in arts organizations is now, when we have the time to actually plan for the future and most successfully leverage your investment. Don't wait for the next state of emergency. Let's not be reactive, let's anticipate. Let's stop this habitual cycle of poverty and precariousness and vulnerability for artists on Capitol Hill and arts organizations on the Hill. It's an honor to be here. I want to thank the Capitol Hill Steering Committee. I want to thank my co-chair, Michael Syrath and Sam Miller of the Lower Manhattan uh, Cultural Council for informing this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, next up is... Capitol Hill, as Chris said, Capitol Hill's own celebrity planner, <laughs> Alex Brennan. Um, I'm going to go off strip, script here for a second and just say that um, I work closely with Alex every day. And I know that if there's an important conversation going on on Capitol Hill, Alex is somehow in the middle of it. So it's an honor to introduce him. Uh, he's become a leading neighbor and advocate for efficient use of Capitol Hill's limited parking supply. And before coming to Capitol Hill Housing, Alex worked as an urban economics consultant in California. He's going to be talking about parking benefit districts. Alex, take it away. All right. Um, uh, so as Joel said, um, I'm here to talk about parking benefit districts um, and uh, starting the first one in Seattle here on Capitol Hill. A parking benefit district is a district where local parking meter revenue stays in the neighborhood to be spent on local needs and priorities identified by our community leaders. Um, to frame that conversation, uh, I want to talk a little bit about why pricing parking is important. Um, also talk about the trade-offs around uh, keeping parking revenue in a particular neighborhood. Also, how much money are we really talking about? Um, how would a parking benefits district work? Um, and how would we make that decision? Uh, so, so first off, uh, unlike what you might have learned um, in playing Monopoly, parking is really expensive. A street parking space takes up very valuable land worth about $40,000. Um, and if we don't use our street parking efficiently, then we have to build expensive off-street garage parking for about $33,000 a space. Um, when expensive parking is, made, is available for free, it fills up. People circle around the block, congesting our streets. Turnover is low, so fewer people can use those spaces. And there's an, more of an incentive to drive, so we end up needing more parking. Um, that's why the city generally charges for parking in our business districts. Uh, despite these benefits, nobody likes to pay for parking, and that's why advocates for pricing parking recommend parking benefit districts. If some of the revenue can stay in the neighborhood, the meters suddenly become a lot more appealing. Um, and this has worked really well in other places around the country, um, perhaps most famously uh, in Old Pasadena, where the creation of a district there in the early 90s transformed a failing shopping center into one of the most beloved neighborhoods in Southern California. Um, of course, like many things, um, there are a lot of special obstacles to doing this here in Seattle. Um, the first obstacle is state restrictions on how meter revenue can be spent. Um, state law requires spending have a nexus with parking. Uh, this probably means some kind of transportation program or project, like free transit passes for residents and employees, uh, maybe sidewalk improvements, or a parking management program. Um, there are also some local obstacles. Uh, Seattle's business districts already charge um, for parking, uh, contributing $40 million to the city's general fund. We can't just take that money away without cutting services, uh, and there are some serious race and economic equity issues with those cuts. Um, uh, if you look at this map of where meter parking is located, uh, the entire south half of the city is missing. Uh, we don't want the low-income communities and communities of color in the south end who have historically been denied public investments to lose out again if meter revenue is kept in the neighborhoods with meters. 
given the challenges with reallocating existing meter revenue, the most promising opportunity is probably opting in to new meter hours. Uh, parking occupancy actually hits its highest point on Capitol Hill at 8 p.m., right when the city stops charging, um, and stays high until midnight. Uh, using the city's own occupancy criteria, this is the most important time to be charging for parking. Um, and extending evening hours in the Broadway and Pike Pine corridors would generate roughly $1.5 million in new revenue. That's enough to provide 4,000 free transit passes uh, or install lighting in all of the dark spots that feel unsafe to walk past at night. Um, how would we do this? Ultimately, the city council would need to vote first in support of the concept and later to create a district on Capitol Hill. To do this, they would need a detailed proposal with broad community support. Today is just the beginning of this conversation. Um, we're probably a few years away from any decision. Uh, one of the most essential elements of any parking benefit district would be who is at the table, who is on the board overseeing spending decisions, and how are those people selected. Oversight would need to incorporate the diversity of neighborhood stakeholders, and the selection process would need to instill real community legitimacy. And long before the district is created and people are appointed, the proposal would need a clear framework for spending priorities. I've mentioned the state limitations and thrown out a few of my own ideas, uh, but this is the time to get creative. What are the kinds of transportation investments that you would like to see in our community? Um, this is the time to get involved. Uh, tell us what you think, give us your ideas. Together, we can figure out a way to not only better manage parking in our neighborhood, um, uh, but also generate revenue for much needed programs and projects. Um, we can make this happen. Uh, Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Alex. Um, batting cleanup this evening is Scott Bonjukian. He's going to be uh, he's here from the Pike Pine Urban Neighborhood Council. And he's going to be talking about lidding I five. Scott, a volunteer with the campaign to lid Interstate five is a practicing planner and urban designer with a passion for sustainable and efficient cities. He also runs the, Ur the Northwest Urbanist blog and is the education and programming planner at The Urbanist. Please join me in welcoming Scott Bonjukian. Yeah. Ditch, canyon, scar, eyesore, commerce. Whatever you call it, there is no doubt that Interstate 5 and the rest of the National Freeway Network has had a profound impact on our country. Nowhere is that impact more noticeable, though, than our urban neighborhoods where these freeways cut through. When I-5 was built in the 1960s, it took up one to two blocks width of our downtown neighborhoods and created a very significant and physical division between our neighborhoods. Between First Hill and downtown, between Capitol Hill and South Lake Union, we now have a large multi-lane freeway that generates a lot of noise and pollution and is frankly quite unesthetically pleasing to people who live and work around it. But the way the freeway was built actually presents an opportunity. The topographical situation roughly from Olive Way to Madison Street has the freeway running in a ditch and traditionally cities have looked upon this as a way to provide new airspace opportunities. We've done this previously in Seattle uh, ten years after I-5 was built, Freeway Park came in with the leadership of civic leaders like Jim Ellis and other people in the, in the region that connect First Hill back to downtown with a nice pedestrian realm. Over time, of course, Freeway Park has been slowly expanded to other and additional, with additional development around it. And of course, also the Washington State Convention Center became its new neighbor. And the Washington State Department of Transportation has been uh, active in building lids more recently as well. When I-90 was built over Mercer Island, a half-mile lid, Aubrey Davis Park was built on the west end of the island along with landscaping and sound buffers, and the Mount Baker lid down in the Mount Baker neighborhood of Seattle was also built to help mitigate the effects of the freeway there. Even more recently, with the Highway 520 rebuild, Washtop built three lids in the east side neighborhoods of Medina um, and Hunts Point to help mitigate some of the uh, effects of the freeway there, and those primarily service parks and transportation spaces. On the west side of the 520 bridge, when that gets uh, extended, we'll also have new lids in the Roanoke and Montlake neighborhoods. So why downtown and why now? Currently, downtown has a lack of about 10 acres of park space, according to our comprehensive plan standards. 
going forward over the next 20 years. With population and housing gro uh, population employment growth, that deficit will only increase the 40 acres if we don't do anything. And we've tried to solve this problem before. Back in the 1990s, some of you may recall the Paul Allen idea for the Seattle Commons, and the idea to have a, a large park stretching from Lake Union all the way to Denny Way. A component of that project required some public funding, and the public voted that down. And of course, that's where the Amazon campus is today. But we have a significant opportunity still. The amount of airspace over I-5 in our downtown region is about the same size as the Seattle Commons proposal. And coincidentally, it's in our highest density neighborhoods. Another stimulus for development in this area is, of course, the Washington State Convention Center expansion over the King County bus station that will soon be closing. We also have a couple of small parks, Plymouth Pillars Park and Green there, adjacent to the freeway that could be expanded in the future. Other cities across the country have faced the same challenges that Seattle does, and they've responded in the same way. Here's a smattering of examples from uh, cities in different climates and cultures that have responded in similar ways by bridging over their freeways for parks and open space. Probably the gold standard for this type of project is, in all places, Dallas, Texas. They built a five-acre park back in 2012 for about $110 million. It is managed by a nonprofit entity but owned by the city, and they did things that are innovative that activate the park and keep it uh, well used all year round, such as building a restaurant into it, including a variety of family-friendly amenities like playgrounds and dog runs, et cetera. Uh, the most ambitious lid park proposal in the United States is in Hollywood, California. The Los Angeles Metro has a significant lack of park space like we do, and they're primarily building this one mile lid over Highway 101 as a public health benefit. The park is currently going through environmental design, and they plan to begin construction for the next year. So that's something to keep an eye on and how they manage that. The Lit I-5 campaign ticked off our public involvement in full force earlier this month with a large charrette that drew about 100 people to uh, 12th Avenue Arts, thanks to our partnership with Capitol Hill Housing. We had people very excited and talking about all kinds of ideas for what should go on the lid, ranging from parks to affordable housing to an amphitheater outside the Paramount to include, even including a downtown elementary school. Ultimately, our plan is for the near future to host more of these charrettes that we hope you guys can get involved with. And eventually, our long-term goal is to build a grassroots coalition of housing advocates, parks advocates, school advocates, and all others to help convince the city council and ultimately the mayor's office that this is a vision worth pursuing. It's going to be an uphill battle, and we're going to have to involve the state transportation agency eventually. And of course, if we don't build lids within the next five to 10 years, I-5 itself will have to be rebuilt as well, since it's in only 10 to 15 years younger than the viaduct, and we can see what condition that's in. So we hope you guys can participate and join us, and I look forward to talking to you one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. All right. <laughs> and thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you. So we were at the Renters Initiative discussion, which was very important. I think uh, one of the things that really encapsulated the discussion for me was when people were going around asking, why, are, why do I live in this neighborhood? And Lauren here said, she, when she was about to move to Seattle, she asked people who know Seattle, what neighborhood should I move into? And everybody's answer was Capitol Hill. And I think that really captures it for everybody. For me personally, just to share with everyone, I grew up in Mumbai, and I am a big city person to the core. And really, in all the neighborhoods I've lived in in Capitol Hill, I mean, in, in America, Capitol Hill really came the closest for me to feel at home. So I really identify with the feeling that others people have of living here. People mention the you know, myriad of reasons why they like this neighborhood, walkability, nightlife, uh, diversity, a feeling of inclusiveness, restaurants, ability to leave their car at home or to not have to own a car at all and above all, a feeling of community. And I think uh, what towered over our entire discussion was the need, the urgent need for affordability and the need for transportation choices as well. And we didn't really get into the, the transportation and the climate change aspect of it, but I think that with housing affordability, you, it's an in, in incomplete discussion unless we include that, so it sort of automatically comes to mind. Some really great ideas came up very quickly since uh, I have very limited time, one of the things that came up was the need for rent control. And we have some people from New York who say that, who, you know, contrary to the boogeyman myths we hear, which as an economist, I'm always strenuously clarifying that those are myths, that actually it works if it's done right, and it's something that Seattle needs. And one of the members of our group said, how exactly, without such a reg regulation on rents, 
can we make the city affordable? Because rents are skyrocketing. Rents are running away from us. So no matter every other initiative we do, unless we control rent, it's not going to work. So that really came up. There's also a very interesting dimension to our discussion. We have uh, people who have been involved in real estate development, incidentally, in New York. And we have uh, property owners in our discussion who both seconded the, the idea that renting needs to be affordable and that they see it from that standpoint. And actually, the property owner we have here, just incidentally, I actually had a discussion, Rita Smith, I had a discussion with her about rent control last year. And she mentioned a very important point, which is that she is already not uh, price gouging her tenants. So if we did have a citywide rent control, it wouldn't affect her because she is not gouging her tenants. So there are many good land landlords or property owners in this city who would not be adversely impacted a rent control policy, what it would do is make sure that gouging didn't happen. A very interesting idea, aside from rent control that came up, was incentives to encourage long-term tenancy. And I think that really, I, f I felt a strong echo to uh, what came up, which is, first of all, I mean, the idea is renter tax initiatives, but more importantly, you know, going back to Zach's point from his presentation earlier about how there's this narrative built over decades, it's not a new thing, built over decades that renters are somehow temporary, somehow you haven't arrived in your life if you haven't bought a home and are not paying a mortgage as opposed to paying rent, because you're still paying somebody, the banks own everything. And, uh, and this narrative that somehow it's a parasitic thing to do, you can't raise your children in a rental unit, so uh, I think there was a strong push in our group to, uh, you know, against that kind of narrative and really ensuring that we changed, we, we provide a different narrative, which is that renting is a conscious choice. It is not a step towards moving. I am not temporarily parking here. This is my home and that I should be recognized. That should be recognized. Renting should be recognized as an honorable and dignified choice. And the other point that came up was the need for permanent affordable housing. We have programs, for example, the MFT has uh, housing units affordable up to a horizon of 12 years. Capital housing, I think most of the units, the maximum is 30 years. 50. Uh, 50 years. And I think those are great things, but I think there was a strong echo in the table, on the table also about permanent, permanent need for affordable housing. And uh, the other points that came up were the need for renters to have their own voice heard. We need renters to play a leadership role. And as our point two says, we need renters to get organized. And I'll just put one quick uh, addition that didn't came up, come up in the discussion, which is that we have the Tenants Union of Washington State. We need the renters initiative. This is my own view. This is not something that I'm reflecting from the group. But I hope everybody agrees that we need the renters initiative to team up with the Tenants Union of Washington State because they are already organizing tenants. And as you know, they helped us, they helped my office organize the tenants in, at Rainier who are now responsible for the Carl Hagland law, which is coming up to a vote next Wednesday. So, 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 uh... Woo! No, no, no gouging on the rent. Who's taking this mic? One question, real quick, Shama Sawant, Council Member Sawant. What's the next step? What do we do? How do we how do we make these ideas a reality? Well, for, first of all, I hope everybody will support us in getting the Carl Hagelin law passed because one of the points that was made earlier in the presentations, also and in the discussion, was uh, fully you know having tenant protections. And so this is just one piece of the tenant protection. This law says that it would be illegal for property owners to uh, increase rents while they still have outstanding housing code violations. That's one part of it. It's not going to solve all the problems. So we need Seattle to be a full-fledged tenant's bill of, have, have a full-fledged tenant's bill of rights. But I would say bottom line, bottom line to make any of this possible, you know, and we haven't even discussed the small businesses need for rent control as well because their rents are going up. The bottom line is we need to get organized. So if renters and small business owners, community activists want these changes to happen, we need to get organized because without that, we will always have less power. And, it's, and that's another point that came up. It's about power uh, you know, and clout and voice in the political discourse. Power and voice and organized. Thank you, Shama Sawant. <laughs> Don Blakeney. Good luck following that, my friend. I know, it's <coughs> got all good stuff here tonight. Business uh, improvement area. Yes. Uh, Are you on the clock? Is he on the clock? How many, how many minutes? 
Five. All right, five minutes. So we had a great group discussion here about the importance of a business improvement area for Capitol Hill. For those of you who missed the beginning when Sierra gave the uh, presentation, a business improvement area is an assessment that property owners put onto themselves to do things for the community that government doesn't necessarily provide and that people don't provide individually. There's about nine or 10 of them in, in Seattle, and we have one on Broadway, but it's only on Broadway. And so there's kind of this sense amongst the group that there's this just disparity of um, place, uh, uh, taking care of the neighborhood. You have the really nice, clean Broadway, but you don't necessarily have that same feeling across the neighborhood. But we thought, beyond clean and safe, like what could you, or sorry, beyond cleaning, what could you think about for funding uh, with a BIA uh, funding mechanism? And we had a lot of great ideas that came out of this. Um, safety is primarily the, the one that came up the most. People felt like they wanted to talk about public safety uh, at night especially, also um, a little bit during the day too. Um, also looking at public restrooms. There's just not a lot of places that you can go to the bathroom in, in Capitol Hill for, uh, there's, there's Starbucks, but not everybody feels welcome there. We thought there'd be a, a benefit to having maybe a staffed bathroom in a couple locations in the neighborhood like they do in other cities. Um, it's, it's, it's a need across this city, at least. Um, we also had uh, general street cleanup was important. They, people wanted uh, the sharps and the, and the litter that accumulates after a lot, large numbers of pedestrians come through our neighborhood. Um, I like that our council member wrote butt litter, cigarette butt litter. Um, it, was, it was shorthand, it was pretty funny. Anyway, sorry, a little potty humor. Um, the, uh, but another thing that came out that I liked a lot was that there, there was a desire to see a holistic conversation in the neighborhood about what our priorities are and that having an organization or a group of organizations coming together to kind of share and steward those conversations about safety and cleanliness and maybe some economic development, that um, it, would, kind of, it would have an opportunity to bring together Broadway and 12th Avenue and Pike Pine and Olive and 15th and 19th and that, that, that engaging everybody in that same conversation would be able to pick up on some opportunities because you have things that, like Sierra pointed out, you have folks that are um, having issues in Calenderson Park, but they're also breaking into cars on 20th. And so if you could have those neighborhoods talking to one another, you could actually be problem solving and reaching out to those folks in a holistic way. So the idea of bringing these conversations together was important. Bike safety was a big deal. How do you get to and from downtown uh, on your bike, um, being an advocate? I think some of these things were about finding that common voice in the neighborhood and going and getting the things that we want for our neighborhood. So bike lanes was one of those big, uh, big ideas. Um, and then also uh, some supporting our small businesses. There's a feeling that we're losing our individual small businesses. Uh, we talked about Bankway on Broadway, where a lot, I think 11 banks have gone in. No offense to our favorite banks in the room, but um, we we, uh, we do have a lot of uh, businesses that are coming in, and we would like a common plan that maybe a BIA or a, a group of people could get together and have a voice about what kind of the future of retail might be for our neighborhood. And then getting down here to the last couple, one of these is some of the stuff in between the buildings that can happen, activation. Um, it's not just about putting a great new coffee shop in, but it's also about how do you take a place like Cal Anderson Park and make it great 24, well, not 24 hours a day, but like, you know, a good portion of the day so it's active and safe and, and inviting and it's programmed. And we've seen some success with uh, some of the other places in Seattle, Westlake Park. How can we maybe use a, a funding mechanism to bring in some more programming? staff the bathrooms, that kind of thing. So those are some of the ideas that we were talking about. Did I miss anything, guys? Oh, yeah, oh sorry, thank you. Construction, we got, we got to that at the very end. There's a lot of construction in our neighborhood, and having a common voice about how to deal with the impacts around that. Uh, Grace was talking about some of the experience that she had um, vocalizing some of the stuff that was going on on 12th Avenue and how we had success getting the city's attention. And I think that having a, a common voice around some of those things around construction can be um, beneficial when we start running into the, the progress and the, and the prosperity that we see. We need to make sure it doesn't suffocate us on the way through. So um, it, th those are some of the issues that were raised. Um, so see, these are great ideas yep. to do with funding that's raised from the BIA. What do we need to do and what would the council member do to get make sure the BIA is passed. Well, she left us a blank check. She said, "Whatever you need me to do, I'm just going to do it. I got to go." Lisa Herbel. <laughs> Lisa Herbel, everybody. Gentlemen. And uh, no, but she said uh, she said that she was really supportive of this, and uh, she understands that she has one in West Seattle too. Um, but the idea is that we'll have to go to the city council and get this approved, and it will have to be approved by the property owners who pay into it. So we're going to be doing a long road show this summer to talk about it. Sierra is going to lead the the charge, and. Uh, we're going to be talking to property owners and tenants and small businesses because everybody's going to be a part of this and um, just communicating and gathering information about what people want to do with it. But uh, it's it's a big effort and uh, it's kind of a big idea for this neighborhood. It'll be a very it'll be a very important way to steward what we want to see going forward for the for the next twenty years. Great job, BIA Group. Are, are Thanks, we still Chris. keep?
Round of applause. Are we still keeping time? Are you still keeping time? Who's next? Arts. You're going to take that so mic. Many, so many microphones. Okay. Calandra, go. All right. You're on the clock. Okay. So we are talking about uh, how to keep arts and culture in Capitol Hill. And uh, we started out talking about how the arts contribute to the livability of Capitol Hill. And I grabbed this card from Owen David at our, at our table because I think it's beautiful. So I'm going to just read this really quickly. The arts add activity, vibrancy, and texture. There's more to life than going to work and paying the bills. The arts serve to remind us of that and help us imagine our futures together. So I don't think there's anybody in this room that's going to argue with that, but good reminder about why we're talking about this. Uh, so we talked about a couple different items. Um, we talked a lot about connecting what already exists. There's a lot of great organizations, a lot of great artists, a lot of great work that's happening already. How do we connect that? How do we make a web out of that? Part of what we're doing already is cultural district. So the first cultural district of the city is here in Capitol Hill. Um, and it's, connect, it's, it's the space in between. We don't need to create a new Velocity. Velocity's fabulous. How do we make sure it's connected with everything else? Um, how do we make sure those artists are connected to the resources that they need? We also talked about uh, the role of the city, what we can do. There are a lot of technical assistance kinds of things that that's the role that we can play. We can be the matchmaker when people are coming in and saying, I need a new space. We can be the ones connecting them with developers. Um, when people say, I need help figuring out how to, how to write uh, a proposal to buy a building or rent a building or do something new and innovative with a building, we can be that resource. So that's something that I think we're doing right now, but we can really invest there and, and deepen that kind of um, skill set that we can bring to the, the whole community. Um, we also talked about how to help navigate the system. There's a lot of um, codes. There's a lot of complicated stuff that's bureauc bureaucratic, but we can help get people through that quickly. So if people come to us, we can help move that through a little faster. We also talked about a couple things that aren't necessarily happening at the moment. We talked about public development authorities. Capitol Hill Housing is a public development authority. Is that an opportunity? There isn't necessarily an arts mission there, but there is a mission to respond to the community. If this is a request to the community, maybe that's an answer. Maybe a new public development authority that's more citywide that can connect all the different neighborhoods and how to create new space across the entire city. Maybe that's an answer. That would give us the ability to, um, to issue bonds and buy buildings. That's not necessarily a position that the city is in right now to buy new buildings. There are a couple of city-owned buildings that are being used as art spaces, but buying new buildings is a little expensive at the moment, as you might be aware. Um, and then we also talked a lot about how uh, it's both easier and preferable to preserve art space that exists. So there's been a lot of conversation about when there's a new building going in, maybe we create art space in the bottom of it, but maybe we need to focus more on what already exists. So how do we invest in, you know, as Tanya was talking about, how do we already invest in the people and the organizations that have the dedicated time and space, and or, I'm sorry, that have put in the time and energy um, over the, you know, the last couple of decades and keep them here? So maybe it's not new spaces in individual buildings. Maybe it goes into some sort of a common fund that's then somehow distributed, the same way that we distribute grants right now, some sort of peer review panel or something like that. That's what we talked about. Well, that's awesome. And you know, this is a round of applause, please. Yay. As the director of a real estate development organization that happens to be a PDA, <laughs> I do think about well, why don't we just buy the building that Velocity is in to ensure that Velocity can stay there forever? Tanya, are you taking notes? <laughs> and 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 you, because you work for the mayor's office, you're gonna you're gonna fund that, right? Well, <laughs> well, we can talk about how that gets funded. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be always. I think to your point, it doesn't have to be a brand new building all the time. Mm -hmm. It could be, how do we preserve, could we have done something with Odd Fellows yeah. before it There's was purchased? There's an incredible, incredible legacy here. How do we make sure we're investing in that and not just re being responsive and reactive? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Great work, guys. Thanks. Where do I go next? This table? Are you guys next? Oh, over here. Parking Benefits District. The Thanks. most important thing we're going to talk about tonight, probably in our lifetime, parking. All right, Joel. <laughs>
We're always talking about parking. I'm Susie. Um, thanks for having me. I am uh, work with Council Member Mike O'Brien. And so I'm here as um, speaking not on, not on anything that, you know, I'm not speaking for Mike, but I will tell you um, both about what our group talked about and some thoughts about next steps. Um, generally, as far as a parking benefits district, there was consensus around the untapped revenue and the idea that um, changing, extending the hours on Capitol Hill for parking fees is a good idea, that there's a lot of untapped revenue that we could have a lot of opportunities to make changes in our community here. Um, the question about where that money goes to, we were, most of the folks in the group thought generally a really broad definition of transportation. There's a nexus, a connection between using parking parking resources for transportation. Um, the group defined transportation to include everything from um, the farmer's market on Capitol Hill to um, transit passes for residents to shared parking opportunities, in bike infrastructure, um, benches in Capitol Hill for pedestrians to improve pedestrian support, um, as well as improved transportation and in the form of public transit. So, that was, that was a pretty unified um, sense. And then there were a lot of questions that came up that complicated all of this, right? The question of what, what does a governance structure look like? Who gets to decide where that money goes? Would that be an entity on Capitol Hill? Who would that be? What's the appropriate um, governance body to decide where those resources go? Um, and then there was the broader question that was brought up around equity of if having the money stay in Capitol Hill um, where, you know, in Capitol Hill, there's parking, paid parking in Capitol Hill, and there's paid parking in downtown, but most areas around the city don't have as vibrant of an economic infrastructure as we do here on the Hill. Um, and so what about other neighborhoods? Would that raise issues where, for example, um, if we have all the infrastructure we need on Capitol Hill, folks here won't vote for a, tra a levy to support broader infrastructure across the city and that we don't want to end up in a situation um, that exacerbates the inequities that exist. And so, you know, what's the balance in that? Um, how can we, how can we, um, how can we, if we're going to do something where we keep the money in the neighborhood, what can that look like um, that, that feels equitable? And how could we even be thinking about who benefits on Capitol Hill, be it a voice for renters, um, and you know, making sure that that we're thinking about equity in in where the money goes. Um, so that was sort of the big. Those were some of the big. There was a lot of. There's a lot of um, good thoughts about it. A lot of places where that funding can go, and then a lot of questions. Um, and I can just say from the city that it's, an, it's a question we're exploring. Um, we have two folks who are working on this a little bit, um, both from SDOT and um, the city council. Uh, Staff, so you know, there's we've requested a statement of legislative intent um, around the parking benefits district. So, um, did you say in June, July, uh, uh, June 30th? June 30th um, keep your eyes peeled for you know. Oh, okay, okay, a statement of legislative intent. Yeah. Rock on. Yeah, so that's hey, what, what is what does that mean? Sure, um, that is a wonky term, um, and, I, and I have to say, I always want to say that it's a, a slee and not a sly, but it's a, we say sly, but it's all wonky, whatever. Um, but basically, it means that we have folks um, on city staff, both in SDOT um, and in our department, who are looking into this just this question and are exploring these questions and thinking about um, what it could mean, how we could do it, what the challenges might be. Um, so there, so just know that, th that it's, it's on the radar, and um, we look forward to you know, continuing to hear people's perspectives as we go forward with that and keep your eyes peeled for a really exciting document to be released um, at the end of June. So is that the next step? Is the next step is the city's going to do the, the, the SLI and then what, what do we need to do? How do, how do the people of the community uh, get involved and push this forward? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think continuing to do what folks are doing and voicing your opinions, talking to your council members, but talking to all the council members, we all want to hear about it. Um, Mike Mike chairs the transportation district, so he'd definitely be interested in hearing your perspectives, um, both about you know the extending the hours as well as kind of where the money would be spent, how we address equity moving forward. Um, so thank you. So you said you didn't speak for Mike, which I understand that, but he's not here. Yeah, it's so true. So go go ahead. Go ahead, <laughs> say that he supports it. It's a, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Everybody, round of applause for a parking benefits district. Over here. And everybody's favorite topic, really, I think, Litting I-5. Who's, Robert. Ready? 
Go. Okay, so we, we have a big, ambitious, fun idea here. And uh, I tried to organize them, so lots of ideas came out of here about what to do covering I-5 and what to use it. The biggest and the most pressing need that came out was open space, the lungs of the city, uh, um, you know, dog run, garden, food forest, mixed mode, run bike. Um, people said, think about the safety because freeway lid, right? The freeway park right now has some problems, has some challenges, particularly at night. So open spaces, meadows, and in Seattle, so umbrellas. Um, also, activated at night. How can we get eyes on the park? Can we have restaurants, cafes, kiosks in the park along the edges of the park? Uh, that has the advantage or the challenges of commercializing it, which means that there's feet and people coming for those attractions and money, but there's also concerns about commercializing and those interests being in the public space. So I'm just going to, those are part of the discussion. Other parts of the design was it needs to be programmed, another piece of safety, food truck area, farmer's market, midway between Melrose Market and Pike Market, we have far another farmer's market there. Um, and then we also talked about other ideas that could go there, school interest for a downtown school, uh, affordable housing, cultural institutions, uh, cultural space, museums, the other places that could go there. And then finally, we sort of talked about process. So questions about the feasibility. Could we do it in phases? It already started in phases. Could we extend that? You know, who would be the stakeholders? Maybe just start between Pike and Pine as proof of concept and build from there. We talked about, uh, can we tie it into the redevelopment that's happening as part of the Pike Pine plan or on the Melrose plan? There are these things happening, build off of those. Have an international design competition. This is a signature place in a signature city. See who would want to be invested and see if we can get international ideas here. Or start with UW students and build from there. There's lots of different ways to go. Uh, money, of course, comes up. So one idea was naming rights in Dallas. It's named after someone who gave half the money for the lid. Um, but that not, not mixed opinions on that one. Uh, corporate partners, mixed opinions on that. State money or federal highway, people are happy to spend their money. Um, and then uh, also just could this be a signature in terms of low impact building? What could we do with solar capturing rainwater and solar and the stormwater? What energy, you know, there's just sort of energy from the cars, whatever. We could do interesting things there. And then we started talking about what would be the video that would be so compelling, the equivalent of the seawall bridge that make people want to do it, showing how it was safer and better because of this. So that's where we went. It was very exciting. Yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> Robert Feldstein. Now, uh, Robert, you you you're from New York City, is that right? I am. Uh, how long how long have you been in Seattle now? Uh, I'm in, in my third year here. Third year. How, are you enjoying it? I'm having a great time. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> so, keeping eyes on the park, um, Capitol Hill housing. We build affordable housing. So, I just have to say that one way to keep eyes on things if people uh -huh. actually live there. So. I'm just putting the plug in for affordable housing because I have to. That's my job to do that. Mayor's and there with you. I don't know if you know about this, but there is an affordable housing and homelessness crisis in this city. So every <laughs> chance we can have to build affordable housing, we should do that. Okay, that was off script. Somebody's gonna, gonna get me into trouble. So okay, what are this is huge. I saw the timeline um, that Scott had up there it was like. 2017, we're talking about it. 2030, we're naming No, we're doing it, it next year. Yeah, oh, we, we figured out. Yeah, we're yeah. building it the next yeah. year. What, and what are the next steps? How do we move this forward? I mean, and truth be told, the city's our priority, and we're, I'm just going to be very real here. The waterfront is our signature park we're putting our money into right now. Right. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't start thinking about the next right. move. And that's where, and those are the work Scott's doing and people like that, is the right move. Starting to get design, getting the experience, so that when, the, when if there's a redevelopment of I-5, we're ahead of them with the state. We're ready with the feds. We have a plan. We're not then starting a Seattle process of figuring out what to do. So the convention so. center is doing a big development, mm -hmm. and they're going to have to pay some public benefits. Mm. And I know there are some people that are advocating for some small portion of that public benefit to be put towards some of the design costs. Is that something that the city would support? I think it's going to be in competition with affordable housing, which, as you know, well, is I think the a big, the, big, the, the big so, amount should go toward affordable housing, so. but a, a sliver towards this. <laughs> We can, that's always a good discussion. All right, good, good <laughs> enough. All right, Lidding Group, I think we're done. Thank you.